everyone, my name is Sydney and I'm Tatum and welcome to our first episode of The Welcome Table. Today we're joined by the lovely Sharla Beatty. Sharla is a graduate of UCI Humanities and she studied literary journalism and now she is a communications specialist at Cox. Thank you for joining us, Sharla. <laughs> yeah, so um, before we get started and we jump into the interview, we just want to do like a little show and tell just so everybody can to get us Sorry, <laughs> just so everybody can get to know us a little bit better. And um, we'll just jump in and I'll just start first. I brought a microphone because uh, it was kind of the origin of how Sydney and I got started with our podcast, Black Fam 2.5. And um, I interned a little bit for the news station at our school, KUCI News. And so this is really central to um, what I'm passionate about. I'm really passionate about podcasting and broadcast journalism. So this is something that really was instrumental in that uh, discovery of that passion of mine. So that's what I brought today. And uh, what did you bring today, Sharla? Um, I sent you guys a photo of my grandfather. Um, it was a side by side of him when he was in the military. And then also when he was older and he worked for the military. And it's special to me because today he's passed away, but today would have been his 101st birthday. Mm -hmm. And just with the passing of John Lewis and everything that's going on, I just was rem rem reminiscing about just how special he was to our family and how much he overcame in his life. Yeah, that's amazing. That's really, really personal. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's very cool. It's cool to have idols like that within your life that you can look to um, for inspiration. And thank you so much for bringing that. That's, that's very cool. It was a great photo. <laughs> it was a nice photo. <laughs> so yeah, I guess we could just jump into this interview now. So what do you do at Cox Communications? How did you sort of get into that field? Sure. I, I work in external communications, so I do anything and everything from managing our social media to writing press releases, writing executive speaking points, um, just helping our various teams with messaging that's facing the external public. So, um, and our public is anyone. Um, we have customers, of course, but we consider the public um, government officials, business leaders, students such as yourselves, um, anyone in the community, and of course, all of our lovely Cox customers. Yeah, awesome. And how'd you, how'd you get into that? <laughs> it's been, I've, I've, my journey went from, I was a literary journalism major at UCI. I, I wanted to be a print journalist. I wanted to write magazine, like long form journalism. Mm -hmm. um, and I started there and then I went to Berkeley for journalism school. My parents were super proud. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was one of the youngest in that class. I definitely was one of the only black people in that class. Mm -hmm. And then a semester into Berkeley, despite the amazingness of the program and the professors, I was like, I'm not sure if this is the right path for me. Mm -hmm. So I left Berkeley um, and I started working in a nonprofit area. I worked for a children's book illustrator and I slowly, slowly started going into like part of marketing and PR instead of journalism. And I think it was also the nature of the economic climate back then. Right. Mm -hmm. cool. Okay, yeah, and is that something that you're passionate about now? Do you find that communications is something that you really gravitate towards? Yeah, absolutely. I always say, like, my name starts with a C, and I always like say I love community and I love communications because I think they're so intersected and important. And I think, you know, even just from like day to day communications with your family are important, but now more than ever, I think it's really important just that people are speaking and sharing their stories and that, you know, we're all learning about each other, and there's a lot of power in that. Awesome. That, yeah. Yes, that's amazing. Um, we wanted to ask interesting little question, get to know more about you. What field would you be in or do you think you'd be in if you weren't in communication? I'd be an interior designer. <laughs> I love Ooh, interior designer. Um, so <laughs> yeah. I, I I try to do what I can around my house, but I, I just love it. I love I took a one of those like work assessments at one point and it was like, you're very into aesthetics. I'm like, yes, I very much like my house to look a certain way. Yeah. Um, it, it works for PR and, and communications too and marketing because that's aesthetically driven as well. Um, but yeah, definitely an interior designer. And if I wasn't an interior designer, I would be a dancer if I was a better dancer. So. No way. <laughs> oh that's so cool. That is so cool. What, what kind of dance? Um, I'm not a formally trained dancer, but I just, I'm, I just like dancing. I love music. Um, so I take some cardio dance classes. I take a lot of ballets. I take some bar classes, okay. but again, not formal dance. I like modern dance too. Okay. That's very cool. That is very cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah. No, in terms of the interior design, 
um, aspiration. Like I can tell because your outfit's very put together. <laughs> and, like I see your little decal in the back. I'm like, she does, she has it together. Like, <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So interior design. So regarding your current occupation, communications, what is your definition of effective communication? And do you believe your version of communication is universal? Um, I think communication is different. I mean, I think that all audiences like take in information differently. The way my parents who are, you know, my dad's almost 80 years old, my mom's 70 years old, the way they take in communication is different than the way my 12 year old stepson does. So I think it has to change and I think it's ever evolving. And I don't think I know the, I don't think I'm, you know, perfect or know the right answer for it. I just think you have to really think about what your audience needs to hear, what they, um, what they're looking for and try to speak candidly into, you know, what their needs are at the time. So I think that um, oral communication is going to become more and more important as we're all in this kind of social distancing world and broadcast communications, I think are going to be revived again, um, just by the nature of this. So I think it just depends. And I love all forms. I love podcasts. I love reading. I love watching the news. I love, you know, I love it all. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's something that's kind of central to what we're doing too um, within our own careers is learning how to master different mediums because communication really is so universal and it's really gratifying to be able to speak to different audiences on different platforms and that's why we look at you as a source of inspiration for that so that's, that's really cool that you're doing all of that. Um, our next question is have there been any major milestones or pivotal moments within your life or career that have led you to this point? Um, I mean, there's a there's a lot of life moments and a lot of professional moments. Um, I worked for a great broadcast journalist named Rachel Harvey Jones at a at a corporate company a while ago, and at that time, her husband, who was a meteorologist at AccuWeather, passed away suddenly, and we were also good friends, and that changed a lot. I mean, it was like you know, I think it was an eye opening to like how how precious life was at that time, and then also like her having to totally step away from her role, you know, in this communications department that she was leading very much opened up my eyes to all that she was doing and forced me to grow and take on more responsibilities. Um, so that was probably in 2010 or 2009. And then from a personal standpoint, I think meeting my husband, um, he had a 15 month old son at the time. And um, I became a stepmom, a pseudo stepmom at 24. My He's turning 12 on Monday. So, you know, like meeting this man that I fell in love with and then, you know, deciding like, okay, well, I'm already in deep and here's this, here's a child and, you know, I'm pretty young at the time. So that was a pivotal changing point in my life. It made me grow up really quickly. Mm -hmm. I've had to learn so much from him and my husband and just from parenting. And then now we have a daughter who just turned three and she's a, you know, she's a girl boss. I wanted her to be feisty and outgoing and everything. And she's all those things. So parenting her in this climate and a seventh grader, um, it's definitely challenging, but rewarding. Yeah, definitely challenging for me. I yeah. like that. Yeah, I feel like it just in general, like, especially during COVID, there have been like a lot of major changes. And you're talking about like changes in your own personal life. But I also wanted to touch on the changes with COVID. I wanted to ask, what are some of the changes that you've seen in your career um, regarding the presence of COVID? Um, I mean, quickly, our company was really great about like, having us all work from home. We started working from home, I think the week of um, March 10th or whatever that day was and you know luckily we're a telecom and technology company so we had those capabilities but just it's hard you know all of a sudden we were all on teams or zoom um, more texting more I am mean um, less kind of water cooler talk less going to speak to each other in offices mm -hmm. and um, that was a big shift and then I work in public affairs so we're usually out in the community doing stuff part of my uh, part of the team that I am on does a lot of community service and volunteering and we had to put a halt to all of that and that was really hard for us all to kind of digest and we're still trying to work around that of how we give back to the community in this COVID era um, and then from a communications from my position as a communications person working with the media you know the media is doing what we're doing they're doing interviews like this they're doing phone calls training our leaders to do this kind of interview now instead of going to a studio is very is different so it's all changing and evolving, but I think it's like, we have such great people who are working at Cox. And I think just in general right now, people, as long as they can be flexible and nimble, I think that we can all make this better for like the future of everyone's career, actually. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that um, Cox has been um, adjusting 
in a positive manner because some other companies like are not so yeah I'm glad to hear <laughs> yeah no that's that's really great that you guys are being adaptable it's you know flexible I, yeah yeah exactly everybody in a sense has to figure out how to how to swim at this point um and in in that light uh, we wanted to ask have you ever worked on a project that hasn't panned out the way you thought it would or would you did you have to like take a different avenue in order to get something done um, in your personal career? I think the moment I alluded to before when I just when I thought I wanted to go to journalism grad school and and then um, the continuation of that story is that I came back to Orange County I started working and I was like maybe it's just like geographically I need to be in Southern California and if I went to a Southern California uh, journalism school, it'd be different. So then I applied and got into USC, Annenberg, and I went there too for a little while. And I was like, no, I, it's just not that. It's just, it's not the right time. It's not the right thing for me. So that was a big pivot. But when I worked at UCI, I started in the middle or right at the beginning of the 50th anniversary. And I was thrown onto this amazing committee with Dr. Thomas Parham, and he um, was leading it. And, you know, I was the first person to hold my position at the libraries. And, um, then we we're doing this 50th anniversary, which was never done before. So there's a lot of pivoting and changes there with the whole team and the whole university. So I'm really proud of all that work that we did and just making it what it was um, under his leadership and under the chancellor's leadership at that time. Yeah, so it was, again, like another adjustment that you very much did successfully. So speaking of challenges, we wanted to ask you if you'd ever experienced imposter syndrome within your professional career. And yeah, I experience imposter syndrome. I think I experience it daily, both professionally and personally. I think I have to, uh, people expect me to be kind of sometimes a token for Black people in PR in Orange County. I'm the first Black president of OCPRSA, which is the Orange County chapter of Public Relations Society of America. And with that comes a lot of like, you know, questions about that and um, expectations. I also put a lot of pressure on myself for being the first Black president, but I also don't want it to just be about me being the first Black president. I want it to be about me, you know, being a PR professional and an educated person and somebody who has a, a decent career and all of that. So um, I think that a lot of times, with me at least, I lead with, you know, I have to sometimes lead with like my credentials or I have to present myself in a certain way when I first meet people or sometimes people think I'm not black when I'm on the phone and then they meet me in person and you can kind of see the the shift mm -hmm. um and that gets that gets very tiring and that gets um I hope that we don't have to do that forever mm -hmm. uh, my parents did that in their careers and they still do that too um they also you know sometimes don't sound quote unquote black over the phone but then growing up, I was considered, um, sometimes black kids would call me whitewash because I was kind of a dork and I was very quiet and I liked to read and I, I played white sports. So I played, I swam and I did lacrosse. And so I just, I, th I think, I really hope like in the future, we don't have these feelings and these labels. Um, but I think it, when you feel that imposter syndrome, it just gives you drive and it makes you more confident inner, on the inside. And it also makes you more humble. And I think confidence and humility are so important. Mm -hmm. Right. So important. Yeah, and kind of touching on that, uh, is there anything relating to that or not relating to this sense of imposter syndrome or having to kind of fill a narrative within your field? Is there anything within your field that you would change regarding that like sense of Eurocentrism or tokenism? Yeah, I mean, I think my my colleagues on the board and, and all PRSA and a lot of people have come before me have done a lot of good work trying to diversify the profession. And I think that's important. I think the generation that's coming from coming behind us is is far more diverse on every on every level, not just race, but uh, gender, ability, sexual orientation. And that's amazing. I just hope that when they're in the, the seats that I'm in today or that my boss is in, that they're that they don't have to be quote unquote, the token, maybe um, transgender person. You know, it's like, I feel like in our country or in our history, we shift a lot. It's like somebody was the token for this, you know, group for a while. Now we've gotten that group to a different level. So now we're going to say, for example, the LGBTQ community, we're going to have a token first LGBTQ president of OCPRSA. Like, I, don't, I hope it doesn't have to be like that. I think there is also power in it being like that because you can it lets you have a platform to tell your story and tell the, and share stories similar to yours. But I just hope those labels maybe aren't always there and the tokenism kind of disappears as we all hopefully become more united. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And 
to that end, on the opposite <laughs> um, end of the spectrum, how do you measure um, your own success or uh, a, a job well done on your part, good things? I like to trust my gut a lot. Um, I try to trust like what my parents and my grandparents raised me on, like the values they raised me on and try to determine what's right and wrong. I try to take a temperature of, of like my colleagues and my friends. Um, and then for me, for successes, like I think that the narrative before me coming into my career was, you know, women, we really are trying to work to have it all. And now it's like, well, can you have it all? And I'm not convinced we can't have it all. So I try, as my kid comes in the shop. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to just look at my day and be like, did I give as much as I could to myself, to myself, taking care of myself, but also my job and my kids and my house and my family and my friends. So, you know, just kind of shifting all the time and making it work. Um, my, my boss says she moms so hard and she, um, what she says, mom's so hard and work so hard or mom's so hard, career so hard. And I think you could do both. And I think women do it a lot. Um, and I think women of color have to do it. It's just the nature of the world right now. So success for me is just if each day I can get most of my stuff done and keep my sanity um, and my yeah. children are happy and everyone's healthy, then I'm good. Yes, that, that keeping sanity part, I feel like it's especially crucial during these kinds of times. So yeah. yeah. Absolutely. She's going to bomb us in about a minute. <laughs> Where's the camera? Oh, hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Okay. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, so that probably actually <laughs> the hardest thing to do. Um, so, yeah. No. And, and to that effect, do you have any advice for future, like, Black journalists, um, PR people, communication specialists? Do you just have any advice for black professionals that want to go into this career field? I think we all have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I think we're still going to be uncomfortable. There's many places I go into where I'm the only one and it's uncomfortable or people say things to me and it's very much like you're just making a general assumption about like how I was raised. You, you know, an example is, oh, you know, are you, somebody once said to me, are you the first person in your family to go to college? Well, no, absolutely not. I'm like, many many people in my family have gone to college and have to advance degrees but it's just like this generic assumption assumption so you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable but also maintain grace and poise and calmness and sanity and um yeah and just learn to navigate kind of that space and it's you know systematically the corporate america and, and journalism room sorry and newsrooms are not fully diverse yet and it's going to take a while so we all got to be patient and just keep moving forward yeah well that was awesome thank you so much Charlotte. <laughs> thank you, guys. great great concluding remarks too yeah, thank you so much for your time and for just making space that's that's we feel like we're a part of that balancing act so we just appreciate well, we giving that that time to us today yeah i wanted to tell you like I won't get emotional, but like when I was in the literary journalism program, I think it was myself and one other person, she works in humanities, Whitney Young. She, um, we were like, I feel like we were the only two black girls in it, but maybe not, she might remember better. And so like the fact that like journalism at UCI is even becoming more diverse and everything is amazing. So I'm proud of you guys. And thank you, thank you for the opportunity. I think Harper wants to say hello. Oh. <laughs> She's like a mashup of you guys. Hi, Hi Harper. <laughs> <laughs> She's shy. She's so like cute. <laughs> Bye. Thank you guys for joining us today for that episode of The Welcome Table. See you guys next time. Yeah, thank you guys. Bye. Bye.